No, I, uh, I wanted to have a opportunity to talk more fully about the difference between this, the Spirit baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what your handout is, is about tonight. Uh, before we get into the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I, I need you to have a really good understanding of what I've been trying to say of what it is. And, and I think this handout will be, be, be helpful. These handouts that I've been giving you are actually part of the research that I did uh, for myself on a manuscript. Now, some of you know, uh, I've written some books and you've read, some of you have read some of them. Uh, and one that I have not published is this study about the Holy Spirit. And it's simply called this, the uh, Spirit of Intimidation. Because it talks about those practices that, that kind of present themselves with other groups as though there are haves and have-nots of those with the, with the fullness of, of Jesus Christ. And so the purpose of the book is so for those of you who have not had those kinds of experiences and, be, and have actually had flags raised and, and you've, you've been in groups where they have and you knew something was wrong but you didn't know what and you, you just didn't know exactly... I wanted to write something so you could pull your shoulders back and hold your head up high again. To not be intimidated by those who would seek to try to make a, a shortcut to holiness and sanctification an experience. And that's the reason we're doing these studies. In my manuscript, the chapter 3 is on spirit baptism. I actually wrote a little introduction that as I was looking at, I thought, I really need to share this. Because for one thing, it, it sets the stage of what we're going to talk about, but it also helps us to get an idea of, of why this kind of study is so significant. And the thing about this introduction is that it is actually a true story. And so let me just, let me just share it with you as, as I wrote it so that it, it comes across in the, in the same way that I wanted to present it. The small prayer group began to calm to a low din that would swell and subside like shallow waves. When the final thank you Jesus was whispered, the circle of ladies lifted their heads. Some rose from the floor. Almost all wiped their eyes. The designated leader turned her attention to the visitor, Angie, a quiet and simple-minded woman, a single parent with a minimum wage job, had attended her Baptist church for years, and this was the first time to sit in on a ladies' prayer group. The leader had felt a stifling of the spirit in the organized prayer services of the church for lack of knowledge, so she had gathered a small core of women of a kindred spirit to pray and intercede. Angie had come to be a part. As the leader approached Angie, there was a quiet focus placed upon them by the rest of the group. Would you like to experience a closer relationship with God, the leader asked. Sure, Angie replied sincerely. Then come sit in this chair and we're going to pray for you and lay our hands so that you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the leader exclaimed enthusiastically. The covey of ladies quickly took their places around the chair, firmly placing their hands on, upon the top of Angie's head and shoulders. The leader began to call out in a, small, in a loud voice, evoking the presence of the Lord to fill the room, to drive out any and every spirit of oppression, to pour His Spirit out upon each one of them afresh, and to particularly baptize their beloved sister with the fullness of His Holy Ghost. Around the circle of voices, some were praying, some were repeating declarations of love for Jesus. Some were speaking in unrecognizable phrases while Angie sat intent and concentrating on the leader's words. With a sudden lift, Angie was drawn to her feet while the women kept their positions affixed upon her head and shoulders. The leader took a stance in front of her and began to cry out in strong, short statements for her to be filled, empowered, healed, baptized, now! And with her final burst of prayer, the leader thrust her palm to Angie's forehead. The group suddenly fell silent as all his eyes focused on the young sister. Angie gradually opened her eyes, looked around with childlike innocence. She turned to the leader and slowly spoke with earnest expectation. What happens next? The group wilted as one, returned to their chairs. No one present tried to explain to Angie what had just taken place because it didn't work. Nothing happened. 
The above is a true account with a single change of a name. My wife was present and, in fact, had brought Angie, and that was not her name, to the meeting in hopes that they could be part of a dynamic day of prayer with a group that valued intercession. My wife had been approached on other occasions to open herself up to the fullness of the baptism, but had declined. She had hoped that the group would only focus on prayer, not try to initiate Angie that day. Angie's simple-mindedness had proven to, both, to be both an invitation and a protection. She had not been exposed to this form of practice, prayer, or instruction before. Her naivete opened her up to be a candidate, but her expectation had not been conditioned by a prescribed experience. She simply wanted to know God better. And when nothing happened, it was blamed on her lack of faith or just not being ready to receive. Fortunately, her innocence also protected her from being damaged by a group who somehow assessed spirituality by conformity to a shared experience. I wish all such stories ended as well. Many sincere believers are drawn like deer to the stream of the, in their thirst for a deep communion with their Creator. When they feel that their church fails to feed them, they will turn to books, CDs, DVDs, programs, or groups to fill in the gaps. What most seek is a path of least resistance that leads to a swift sanctification and personal fulfillment in Christ. The baptism of the Holy Ghost becomes the focus. It offers spiritual acceptance by God and others, deeper communion, power over victory, or power for victory, healing from satanic attack, and unspeakable joy and inner peace. What child of God would not line up for that? Some embrace the experience under the belief that it is sound. But if you have ever felt uncomfortable concerning this experience and its array of manifestations, either in a worship service or a small group setting, I invite you to examine the following study concerning spirit baptism. And that's what we're going to begin looking at tonight. Its purpose is not to bash a group, but to examine a movement. The ecclesiastical division between the haves and the have-nots have caused enough schism in the body of Christ. It's my prayer that some wounded warriors of the faith will be able to read the following, pull back their shoulders, and stand erect once again. The enemy is not the brethren. It's civil sibling rivalry, which confuses the world and destroys the witness of the cross. I feel fairly confident that the following will make little difference among the already convinced and initiated because emotionally held beliefs are seldom countered with our mental arguments. But may the Word of God reach more than the mind. From there I go into the, the information that we're going to begin looking at tonight and for the next actually two weeks we're going to look uh, at the evidence of spirit baptism with next week and then the week after that it's in it's in two parts as you look at this handout that you've gotten tonight the baptism and filling of the holy spirit the purpose of this handout is to as i said last week to illustrate clearly the difference between and the distinction between the baptism of the holy spirit and the filling of the holy spirit i made mention to you uh, about a week or so ago that these are sometimes confused by by charismatic groups as being one and the same but they are not and as I tried to illustrate last week, visually with the baptism of fire, that you actually saw baptism as being an immersion, we're going to be looking at that again tonight too. Uh, you'll probably remember these, these diagrams that you're going to be looking at on this sheet as to the ones that I used when I sh shared about you in Christ and Christ in you. And when I did that, it was actually... Uh, not explained fully in the, in, in the area of the work of the Spirit, but tonight it will be. Because everything about us being in Christ means we are in the Spirit. And everything it means about Christ being in us means the Spirit is in us. And so we're going to look at these today, uh, tonight. Uh, I want to start by uh, reminding you the activity of the Spirit of, in salvation accomplishes these two inseparable truths. John 15, well, I'm not going to turn you to those, but just to remind you. Uh, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in you, the same brings forth much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And that's what these two figures try to illustrate. The very foundation of Christianity is this twofold relationship that we have with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, by these two inseparable truths that when a person in, 
in humble repentance and faith, praise to receive Jesus, to praise to repent of their sin and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, two things take place. One, they are placed in Christ, and as I've always said, that will forever change the way God sees you. But secondly, Christ comes to dwell in you, and we've been talking about that for the last month or so, uh, in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that has the potential of changing the way the world sees you. Because it's Christ in you that becomes that hope of glory, the glory that, that the world can see the image of God through you. 1 John 4.13 is just simply a reiteration of this truth, and I'll just read that one for you real quick. Um, 1 John 4.13 By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. The activity of the Spirit in the believer is the evidence of the fact that this dual relationship exists, that we are in Him and He is in us. And we're going to see how that takes place a little bit more clearly in just a second. Romans uh, 8, 9, and 10 is that passage that we've been looking at about the, uh, has the, the three passages or the three references of the Spirit all in one verse. But just to remind you again, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So, these are the things that we need to be aware of. When we become Christians, two things take place. The believer is placed in Christ. Christ is placed in the believer. Last week I gave you the picture of, of baptism with that person laying down in the baptistry to look like an alien in a, in a tub. But uh, it was to remind us that the word baptized means to be fully immersed. There are two church ordinances that we practice. One we practice one time, and one we practice on an ongoing basis. The one-time church ordinance is baptism. And as I have indicated before, even from the baptistry, this is the picture of us being placed in Christ. It's not just our death, burial, and resurrection, and raised to walk in a newness of life. It is the picture and symbol of you and I being placed in Christ. And we'll see that in just a moment. Every quarter, or as often as we do, we take the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper should be, for us, a reminder of that we are His, and that He is coming again, and the price that was paid for our salvation, and how He, he uh, gave His life for us with His body, and his, poured out His blood as a remission for our sins. And we do this as kind of a, a remembrance. But do you realize what you're doing? I don't mean to make this sound real Catholic, but you're taking Christ in. Christ goes in you through the Lord's Supper. You go in Christ through baptism. So both of the two church ordinances illustrate these two truths. And by the way, I'm not trying to say that the, the, the Catholic understanding of transubstantiation that we are actually... You, you, I don't have to explain that. Okay, so... What does it mean for you to be in Christ? That first diagram that we have. And, and, and I'm just going to show you this again and to remind you of what I told you when I told you before. God looks at you, sees a sinner by nature, a sinner by choice. But in Christ, He looks at you, He sees Christ. And with that, He can call that righteous. And with that, you and I are pleased and we're placed in, uh, in a standing that God can accept. But let's look at some of these passages. What does it mean to, for the believer to be in Christ? Uh, David, I think you had the first one. Actually, in this verse, you've got both pictures. You have, by one spirit, we were all baptized. And there's that picture being placed in one body. And that's, and we're going to see more and more. This is this is the important thing of what to be baptized into Christ is to be baptized into the body of Christ. And this is why the church is then referred to as the body of Christ. One of the titles that we've been looking at on Sunday night. 
Okay, Ethan, you had Galatians 3.27. Okay, and this again is that picture. To be baptized into Christ means to have put on Christ. You are in Christ. And again, it's that picture. And if you might recall, I used uh, uh, the, the, my coat and I talked about how when we're uh, in Christ, it's like we are then clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He wears it to take our sin. We wear it. We wear His righteousness because we are in Him. God looks at us, or looks at Him, and He's pleased. As we're about to see in Ephesians chapter one, verses five and six. In the beloved, or in the, how does it say? In the one he loves, okay. That's the NIV, isn't it? Yeah. Um, New, New King James or King James says, uh, he has made us accepted in the beloved. And that's, that's the picture. How do we stand before God? We're not approved. We could never be approved. The only way we could stand before God is to be accepted. And the only way to be accepted is to be in the beloved. That picture again. He looks at you. He sees him. And he says, that I can accept. And that's our, that's our entrance into his presence. All right. So in Christ changes the way God sees you. It places us in Christ, in the body of Christ. And we are accepted in him. But not only that, Christ now comes to dwell in us. Galatians 2.20 It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives. And where does he live? In me. Ephesians 3, 16 through 20. This is one of Paul's just most beautiful prayers, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. But did you hear uh, what he says, that we may be strengthened through his spirit, where? In the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, Christ in you, once again, and that uh, you may be filled, verse 19, with all the fullness of God. This is, this is the... The mystery of godliness. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Philippians 1, 19, 20, and then 2, 13, I think you had. For I know that through your prayers and the hope of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out to my deliverance. As it is my year of expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. So that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether my life or by death. Okay, and then 2.13. For God, for it is God who works where? In you. And this is that verse that I keep telling you I think is a good definition for grace. Grace is when God gives to us the desire and the ability to be pleasing to Him. That's what this verse says. For it is God who works in you both to will, that's the desire, and to do, that's the ability of his good pleasure. Uh, if Jacob was here, I would have asked him to read 1 John 3, 24, so I'll read it in his place. Now he who keeps his commands abides in him, and he in him. 
And by this we know that He abides in us. If, you have, if you're looking at it, you see the capital H's, you know that He, capital H, uh, uh, that, that whoever keeps His commandments abides in Him with a capital H, and He with a capital H abides in Him with a little h. So it's, it's real clear when you're reading it. And by this we know that He abides in us, how? By the Spirit whom He has given us. So it is the, the work of the Spirit that places us in Christ. It's the work of the Spirit that is the presence of Christ in us. So if you turn your sheet over now, uh, we're going to be looking again at what does it mean when we, when we read the Scriptures, we find a whole host of different descriptions of what it means to be a Christian. And you've heard a, a lot of these expressions before. And I just wanted to show you how I, what I did was I took them from the Scriptures and then placed them in one of these two truths. What happens sometimes is that we get out of balance by emphasizing something over another. I'm convinced that traditionally as Baptists, we, uh, we are really, really strongly firm in the fact that we are in Christ and so we are secure and we're going to heaven because we're in Christ. Other groups are more emphasizing the fact that Christ is in them and therefore the activity of the Spirit becomes more emphasized. It takes the balance of both of these truths and not the exclusion. I've made this question before and, and probably you may remember so that this won't come as a surprise. It won't be a trick question, hopefully. But uh, you're a child of God. How many of you are children of God adopted by, the, by God? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, how many of you are in the family by birth? By, there you go. Raise your hand again. Because the Bible says that we have been born into the family of God. We've been born again, John chapter 3. And we've been adopted. Paul uses the expression of adoption. John uses the expression to be born again. And so you can't set one against the other. They're both, they're both true. One illustrates one truth of your relationship to God. The other illustrates the other truth of your relationship to God. So let's just look at some of these expressions. The believer in Christ is described for us by Paul as being adopted by the Spirit. That expression is used in Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.4 4 and 5. We're not going to turn to all of these. We'll run out of time if I try to open up all of these. But adoption just simply means we were placed in the family of God. It's a placement. And so to be adopted by the Spirit is to be placed in the family of God. We've talked about this one before, when I talked about being sealed by the Spirit. And that is that he, we've been placed again in Christ so that we are completely sealed. Much like Jesus was sealed in the tomb, he, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we are in Christ and the Holy Spirit becomes our seal. 2 Corinthians 1.22 is one of those. And I've read to you before, Ephesians 1.13, that we have the guarantee of the Spirit. We've been sealed by the Spirit. This places us in the kingdom of heaven. We've been placed in the family of God by adoption. We've been placed in the kingdom of heaven by the sealing of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6.11 and the other places, we will find that we were justified uh, here it, it says specifically we're justified by the Spirit. So I use that as the passage. But to be justified means to be placed in a clear standing before the Father. You see, once we're placed in Christ, He looks at us, sees Christ, and declares that righteous. That's justification. Justification, we are justified before God because we are in Christ. That's what that passage said that when we talked about accepted in the beloved. Uh, this is how we are accepted. We are justified by placed in clear standing before the Father in Christ. And then you have this expression, Acts 1.5, to be baptized in or by or with, because the, the, the participle can be translated either way. So I think it's more accurate to say baptized in the Spirit because 
it helps us to see, and, and we've already read this passage from 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Uh, one of you already had that one. Uh, that it says, by one spirit we have all been baptized into one body. And that's this baptism of the spirit. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you were baptized with the spirit. You were baptized with the spirit because you were baptized in the spirit. We, were, we have all, and that's what I think is also significant about 1 Corinthians 12, 13. There is no haves and have nots. If you're a child of God, if you have Jesus, as Romans 8, 9 says, you have the Spirit. And that Spirit placed you in the body of Christ. That's why the, all those who've been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That expression of baptism is the picture of being immersed in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why the picture is like it is. You are in, immersed in Christ. That's what the baptism of the Spirit looks like. And it takes place the moment you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And that's what places us in the body of Christ. And on Sunday nights we've been talking about the church. And that's what the church is. We collectively are the body of Christ. What we are talking about on Sunday nights is the church. And this Sunday night, we're going to be looking at the church triumphant. There's nothing more exciting than to be a part of God's church, the body of Christ. Then there's the other side of the coin. Not only are we in Him, that changes the way God sees us, puts us in the church, puts us in the body of Christ. And that's why I think sometimes we've gotten it confused by we say we think in terms that baptism is the doorway to the church. No, not the water baptism. The spirit baptism is what brings us into the church. When we go through water baptism, what we are going through is like a public ceremony of our commitment. And that's, that's what it is. And so, we, it's, it, yes, it is important. But the baptism that is essential is the spirit baptism. And that takes place when you and I give our heart and life to Jesus Christ. The other side of that coin is that then Christ comes to indwell in us. We find, we've got some other titles that we found in Scripture. Uh, we've already talked about this. Are, were you adopted or were you born into the family of God? Well... Those of you who are adopted, raise your left hand. Those of you who are born, raise your right hand. You should be standing there like that. You know, we are both. We are adopted because we're placed in the family of God. But God is born through us in what we have commonly referred to as regeneration. John chapter 3, been born again. And to be born again means that you've been born not only of, of a physical birth but of a spiritual birth. And that's what the water refers to the, spirit, the physical birth. The spirit refers to the spiritual birth. There in John chapter 3. So, John chapter 3 and then 1 John 5, 1 through 6. Uh, whoever believes that Jesus is the, uh, the Christ is born of God. We're going to be looking a whole lot at 1 John next week. You want to know where the evidence of spirit baptism is? It's not in 1 Corinthians it's in 1 John. You go through and you read 1 John, you'll find out how many times John wrote in his letters, by this we know that we are a child of God. By this we know that we are saved. By this we know and that we are of Him. And he presents clear evidence of, what it, of, of the fact that we are Christians and that we have been baptized into His, his, his church, into His body. But... He also talks about being born of the Spirit, whether it's in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus or 1 John chapter 5 in his letters. In John 6, 63, there's talk about uh, how we are quickened by the Spirit. Same in Ephesians 2. Quickened means that's that aspect of the resurrection. The resurrection of life uh, of Jesus Christ has resurrected us from death to, to, to life. And so uh, there is the resurrection of the believer through the Spirit. There is the residence 
of the Holy Spirit in the believer, indwelt by the Spirit of God. And we've looked at this passage repeatedly. Romans 8, 9 says, Unless you have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. Uh, the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. And 1 Corinthians three sixteen as well. There's an, I want you to see this one. Turn in your Bibles to this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because here is again part of the work of the Spirit from within us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I used this passage uh, a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, Satan's attack and talked about specifically uh, the sins that are listed in verses 9 and 10. And, and it's, a, it's a, a horrible array of, of, of sins. And he's, he's making the comment, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he begins to list all these things that people do. But then he adds, verse 11, And such were some of you. You used to do some of these things. But repentance, leading to forgiveness, brings you into a position with God that you have been washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Only God can clean a filthy, only the Spirit can clean up a filthy life. It's not going to be personal self-control. It's not going to be turning over a new leaf. It's not going to be resolutions. It's not going to be, you know, holding your breath and, and trying your hardest. It's going to be by the Spirit of God that these chains and these, these sins, particularly these sins, can be overcome in your life. Uh, at the pastor's conference this past Monday, we saw a video clip of a, of a, uh, a very, <clears throat> very large Baptist church in another state brag about the kind of people that was welcome in their church. And begin to list some of the things from this, these, these two verses. Of verses uh, 9 and 10. And we're sitting there with our mouths just dropped. It's one thing to say that they're, they're welcome to come and hear the gospel. But don't call them one of us until they enter into repentance. Until their lives have been changed. Until what can be said about them in verses 9 and 10 can be said about them in verse 11. But some of you were washed, and sanctified, and justified. This is a work of the Spirit. It is that which redeems us from our former lives. The church may be a hospital for sinners, but it is not a haven for sinners. It is a place where everybody is welcome to come just as they are, but to come with the expectation and understanding that God doesn't want to leave you the way you came. And there should be change. And, uh, and that's how we present the bride of Christ to Him uh, as, as pure and clean. It's the work of the Spirit that we uh, are washed and sanctified. Uh, again, Regenerated and renewed, Titus 3, 5, and 6, is that restoration of life. But the most significant, and we won't dwell a lot on this tonight, I'll just uh, I'll have some comments to say here at the very ending. Ephesians 5, 18, you know this passage too. Be not drunk with wine, where is in excess? But be, and this is that picture of Christ in you, filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we went through the study of uh, My Heart, Christ, Home, I kept saying, this is a perfect illustration of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because the filling of the Spirit is something that is ongoing, much like the Lord's Supper is ongoing. That the Christ in you is always finding areas of your life that He hasn't had access to yet, that He wants access to. Whether it's the dining room or the... Uh, library or the uh, uh, the hall closet you know those are the areas that as we surrender them to his control 
and we yield those areas of our life, we are in the process of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I was asked one night, what's the filling of the Holy Spirit? I said, well, it's two words, and one of them I know that people in Trenton don't know anything about. Uh, one is surrender, the other is yield. <laughs> uh, I know people in Trenton don't know what the word yield means. I, 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 all the intersections that have those signs, they do anything but yield. But when you are surrendering yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and then you're yielding your will to His... You are in the process of being filled by the Holy Spirit. And it will be an ongoing process for the rest of your life. It is the reign of King Jesus in your life. And so those are the things that, what is Christ in the believer? It's the work of the Spirit that fills us, regenerates us, washes and sanctifies us, and dwells us, quickens us, and brings about a new birth. Let me close with these, this last bit here. The baptism of the Spirit is one of several expressions that describes the activity of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the one that's found in number four above. One is baptized in the Spirit at the same moment that he or she is born again and dwelt by the Spirit, redeemed, restored, and made a part of the kingdom of heaven, the family of God, the body of Christ, and clear standing before the Father and accepted in the Beloved. <laughs> that's what it means to be a believer. That's what it means to be a Christian. All of those things. And so... The baptism of the Spirit takes place. So, let me, let me go ahead and prompt you, okay? If you are ever asked, well, have you ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You say, well, absolutely. The moment I gave my life to Jesus. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, then you need to take another look at what you're talking about. And learn to define the terms according to Scripture. Always let Scripture interpret your experience. Don't let your experience give meaning to phrases in Scripture and then try to teach that as truth. So, that's what it means to be baptized in the Spirit, is that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the Spirit took you, placed you in Christ, and that was your baptism. The baptism is a picture of one's position in Christ rather than the infusion, and that, this, that, that's the confusion they do. They call the, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, or the, the baptism, the same thing. They're two totally different pictures. One is you inside something, in this case Christ or the Spirit. The other is that something being inside you. It's two totally different pictures. And so it's two totally different things. It's not the infusion of the Spirit for some second purpose apart from salvation. You'll hear this. Methodists made this really popular. They called it the second blessing. And they said, you know, well, you received Christ, but have you received the Holy Spirit? Well, I read my Bible, and according to my Bible, it says I did the moment I received Christ. Because if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I don't have Christ. All believers have the Spirit all believers have been baptized into Christ's body by the same Spirit. And that's what that passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 said. And that's what that passage in Galatians 3, 27 taught us. That we have all been baptized into Christ and we've all been made to drink of the same Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit after conversion in the process of sanctification. It's not synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is an event that occurs at conversion. The filling is the control and direction of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. We are filled with the Spirit when we surrender to His control and yield to His direction. And that, I hope, gives you a good picture of the distinction and difference between the filling and the baptism and will help you in responding to anybody who may ask you, you ever been baptized in the Holy Ghost? I say, absolutely. I can remember the day. I was eight years old and I, I knew I was a sinner and I, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ and He came into my heart, came into my life. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, yes it is. Because when He came into my heart, He also took me and placed me in Him. And it happened at the same time. So, any questions or need for clarification of any of this at this point? 
If not, then next week we will we'll be looking up... In fact, if you would want to prepare a little for next week, read 1 John. Just read the little book of 1 John. And when we come, most all of the verses that we look at are going to come from 1 John. And it's going to, we're going to look at it as the evidence of what it means to have been baptized by the Spirit of God or to be born again or to be, have become a child of God. Okay? All right. I know the men are going to have to meet afterwards, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll try to get to that as quick as we can.